Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today during Climate Week for our first of three events during Climate Week that the Waterfront Alliance is sponsoring. For more information, check out our website. But I'm really excited about today's presentation on the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines Program. This is a program that was started over 10 years ago and has evolved into a mature and now nationally applicable standard for waterfront development. And I'm just really excited that Joseph is at the helm and that I can see from the participants, there are quite a few of you who were involved in the early stages and we're really glad to have you here. So uh, before I leave, I want to uh, just mention that our gala is coming up on October 12th and it's a, usually it's always the best, the best party in the, in the harbor in the region. So um, it's going to be in New Jersey this year for the first time. Please join us. It will be a huge night of networking and a lot of fun. So check out our website for more information. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Joseph to get started. Thanks, Joseph. All right. Thanks, Courtney. I am Joseph Sakawi, the Chief Waterfront Design Officer for Waterfront Alliance. Uh, my role is to lead the, the WEDGE program, lead the, the reviews on some of the projects that we're, talk, we're talking about today. Um, I come from a, a consulting background, working a lot with Port Authority and an economic development background. I'd like to introduce Domenica Stasiak, my co-presenter today, a partner at Indigo River. Good morning, Domenica. Good morning. Thank you, Joseph. <clears throat> my name is Domenica Stasiak. I'm a registered professional engineer. I've been working in the New York City Harbor for almost 20 years now. I'm currently working on uh, Harlem River Drive Greenway with New York City Economic Development Corporation and Langan is the prime. Uh, that's just one of the many projects that I'm working on, but might be ones, one that people are most familiar with. Looking forward to presenting to you to, today. Thanks, Domenica. So Waterfront Alliance is an advocacy organization that seeks to inspire and affect resilient, revitalized, and accessible coastlines for all communities. Most of our organizational focus is on New York Harbor and the, on, on both sides of the Hudson and on all of the different waterfront issues that come to play in the harbor. WEDGE is a national program, it's our only national program, and has projects in the pipeline in Miami. There's one completed in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, but we're going to focus today on the, the New York City component of it, given that it's um, Climate Week NYC. Some of our other work involves um, our annual Waterfront Conference, our Waterfront um, Heroes of the Harbor Gala that Courtney just touched on, as well as advocacy for things that are going to benefit the, the region. We were one of the, the voices that helped get New York City Ferry off the ground. Um, the now um, once every 10 year comprehensive waterfront plan, um, putting a, 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 some regular timing on that was uh, the result of our advocacy. We also do educational programming through our Estuaries Explorers Program, climate resilience policy through our Rise to Resilience Coalition, um, and a number of other initiatives um, focused on New York Harbor. To start with uh, setting a little context around um, you know, the projects that shape the harbor, the, the topic for today's conversation, we wanted to give a little bit of a history lesson and remind folks that our waterfronts have been constantly evolving. Um, even their location has actually changed over time. I love looking at this image from the book, um, The Lower Manhattan Plan, which was the, the 1966 version or vision for downtown New York. Um, this shows the four different coastlines, 1650, 1800, 1965, 1980, so that you can see just how much the waterfront in Lower Manhattan has changed. And as they were, they were digging out Ground Zero after 9-11, they actually found an 18th century ship within the bounds of, of Ground Zero because that's how far inland the water had been originally. And very few places within New York City have their original waterfront. So, you know, the, the change in Lower Manhattan is probably something that's pretty obvious in that and that we're all familiar with, but Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and the Bronx have all had bulkhead walls that have reshaped the waterfront. They've all had giant piers and landfill. JFK and LaGuardia reshaped Flushing and Jamaica Bays. Um, Manhattan's Marble Hill was once an island that had a canal in a cut in a small creek. 
Um, and it was at one point shallow enough to wade across. Um, and then that got filled in. And now the Bronx is where Marble Hill is geographically located, even though it's still technically part of Manhattan. So this change um, has happened across the city. And to understand you know, the projects that are shaping our waterfront today, we need to understand a little bit of history. And this is not even remotely close to a comprehensive look at at you know the things that it, the, the the big periods and events that have shaped the waterfront. Um, but I just want to pull out a couple highlights. So our first pier on in New York Harbor was on the East River in 1659. The first time we stopped kind of dragging up the boats onto the onto the beach um, in 1846. Um, there were the state legislature created um, land grants to railroads along the waterfront. And that was the first time that this you know, public doctrine of, of everybody has access to the waterfront was challenged. And that set in stage a lot of the, the lack of access for industrial facilities that we have today. One of the, the big challenges uh, across time in the, in the harbor was the cleanliness. And in 1849 is when we first started to um, create the combined sewer overflow system that has, um, in times of heavy rain, sewage flow directly into the, into the river. In 1934 is when Robert Moses showed up and, and created a lot of the big infrastructure projects that have shaped the waterfront, some of which um, have, have had benefits that last to the day, some of the, some of the beaches, though they're not as accessible as maybe they should be. Um, and then other components of his work um, created some, some really negative legacies across New York City. But between the beaches and the bridges and the, the, the incredible amount of infrastructure projects that he led, he more than kind of any one person really shaped what New York's waterfront looks like today. In 1956, we had the creation of the Port Elizabeth Container Terminal. That was the kind of signaled the start of this migration of industrial activity and port activity from New York into New Jersey with a, a big emphasis on Elizabeth, Newark, and Bayonne. In 1972, we had the Clean Water Act, which was the start of kind of this massive cleanup of the, the harbor that's still ongoing today. In 1976, we had the, the Battery Park City Landfill was completed, um, coinciding with the, the development of the Twin Towers. In 1992, the, the New York City was starting to realize that, hey, there's a lot of change happening along the waterfront, and they created the first comprehensive waterfront plan. Um, and that's something that, that, as I referenced, thanks to Waterfront Alliance, is now happening every 10 years so that it's uh, an up-to-date and, and utilized document. In 2007, Waterfront Alliance launched. We were back then the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance. In 2012, Hurricane Sandy devastated New York City. And we'll talk in a couple of the projects that we'll show off today, um, what some of those impacts were. In 2017, New York City Ferry launched, um, creating new access in places where, you know, you often had trans transit deserts along the waterfront. Now there's much better access. And then to look into the future, in 2026, ESCR, the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, that will be completed, which is the first in a series of large-scale resilience projects that are reshaping Lower Manhattan. So across all of these, a couple of themes emerge that I, that I wanna talk about in relation to the WEDGE standards, Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines standards. So we're seeing a renewed emphasis with ESCR, following Sandy, uh, a number of other things, a new focus on coastal resilience and sea level rise, um, knowing that those are, uh, particularly as we're seeing new investment on, along, on the waterfront, we need to be building resiliently. Public access and changing land uses are, are coming up. We're, we're shifting away from this former industrial base on the waterfront, a lot of old warehousing, um, a lot of underutilized spaces. Um, you'll see those in some of the historical photos that we'll show. And now it's becoming much more 
residential mixed use park spaces. Um, and that's creating new opportunities for public access. And now as we're seeing the, the harbor continue to get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner, which is wonderful, new opportunities for ecology, new opportunities for our habitat space and groups like Billion Oyster Project, um, Shirley Chisholm State Park um, are really taking a, a big lead there. And WEDGE is set up to kind of address these challenges. We're looking at resilience, ecology, and access as the three main tenets of the, the WEDGE standard. WEDGE was created um, about a decade ago um, with as the, the region kind of renewed its focus on climate resilience after Hurricane Sandy. Um, and we were seeing kind of new opportunities emerge for projects across the city to take advantage of the, these standards. So we'll talk a little bit about the standards next. I'll go into very, very briefly kind of how it works. And then we're gonna um, have a series of case studies that show kind of before and afters of sites across New York Harbor um, on sites that have used the web standard. So you can see just what kind of change is possible when we're using a concrete set of guidelines that are designed to create the best waterfront possible. So WEDGE just structurally, at its heart, it's a rating system. There are a series of categories within each of those are credits that are encouraging projects to do certain design strategies um, that are going to have resilience benefits that are gonna benefit the ecology of the site, or they're gonna benefit public access in the broader neighborhood. Projects that earn enough points through implementing these design strategies get what's called wedge verification. Um, and it's a really rigorous standard to meet. It's not something that very many projects can do. It's designed to reward really the best of the best projects. Some of those projects are here in New York. We have 10 verified projects um, across the country. Nine of those are in New York because we started as a New York based standard. Um, and have, have only recently switched to um, something that's nationally applicable. Uh, so we have 10 projects today. There's another nine projects in the pipeline. And just to show you kind of the geographic spread of those, um, they're, they're across residential, industrial, and park spaces. They're in the Bronx, they're in Queens, they're in Brooklyn, they're in Staten Island. And then the project pipeline has projects um, in Manhattan, those will be the, the first ones in Manhattan. Um, we have five in progress in various places in Brooklyn. Um, there's another one in Queens that's, that's in the pipeline. Um, and then we also um, have a park space in Miami that, that um, we won't focus on today, given that this is a, a New York um, focus talk. To talk a little bit about how WEDGE shows up in kind of the regulatory space, I just wanted to share a couple examples of how different cities across the country are utilizing WEDGE. So in Miami, we're in a set of design guidelines for the city. Port Authority of New York and New Jersey uses us as part of their sustainable infrastructure guidelines. So we're kind of a bonus set of points within their own internal system. We're in zoning code in New Rochelle. We work with Camden, New Jersey to essentially help them create their own version of WEDGE. Um, in the borough of Brooklyn, um, there's a, a resolution from the borough president's office that says every waterfront project should go through wedge and across different community boards um, throughout the city there are 31 of the 39 waterfront community boards that have have some form of resolution either with the community board itself or at the borough president's level that say um, they want waterfront projects to go through wedge um, and then other cities are just embedding, including New York, are just embedding wedge requirements into requests for proposals. To give you a sense of kind of what it takes to get wedge verification, as I said before, it's a very rigorous process and it's, it's done um, by an independent set of reviewers who are not connected to the project in any way. So a project will typically be reviewed by us twice. We're gonna look at it in what's called the preliminary review early in the design process. And then we're gonna do a final review, essentially when the project gets to the point where they have blueprints, they're kind of locked in with what they're gonna build. 
and we're going to look at things like their site plans, the design drawings, um, contracts, and we're going to take a group of typically four external reviewers, usually a civil engineer, a landscape architect, somebody with flood modeling expertise, an environmental professional. That group is going to pour through the project documentation in incredible detail to figure out is this aligning with the standard or not? Is this good enough to get the wedge verification? Um, so we'll talk now about some of those projects and the way that we're gonna structure this is that I'll go through a couple of the, the key components of each category of wedge, what we're looking for in that section of wedge. And then I'm, I've asked Domenica, who has just incredible familiarity with projects across New York Harbor to give us kind of the case study of what, what this project um, has turned out to be and what um, kind of what the historical perspective on the project is. Um, so our first category that we'll, we'll look at is site assessment and planning. And this is kind of all that upfront due diligence work for projects so that they are in a good position to create a really solid design and plan for the project. So we're looking at, did they pull together a multidisciplinary team? Did they include environmental professionals throughout the, the process, things like that? Um, Site-wide social and ecological context and vulnerability assessments are all about, do you know what climate hazards this project's gonna face? Have you incorporated and, and seen what sea level rise projections are for the site? Do you know what the community is going to value? Are you have you looked at the historical um, site uses and kind of context for the community? Community engagement comes in here as well, and we're looking at what did you create an, an equitable process for community engagement? Did you create opportunities for diverse feedback? Is it a two-way conversation? All those things are what we're assessing, and then maintenance and adaptive management plans. Um, come in here. So I'm going to turn it over to Domenica now, who's going to talk through two projects that did exceptionally well in this site assessment and planning um, category. Domenica. Thank you, Joseph. So our first project we're going to look at is Domino Sugar. Um, <clears throat> for about a hundred years, this, this area was used as a plant where vessels would bring sugar and it would be offloaded here from, from the vessels. It closed around approximately 2004, um, just after World War II, uh, if, as it declined during World War II. Um, currently, Two Trees has transformed this site, which was had almost no green space, into this beautiful park. Um, the areas in which the they reached the category, which, which Joseph mentioned earlier, was their strong emphasis on community engagement and including the community in the process, having significant partnerships, um, and then passive and, and active recreation throughout the entire park for the community. Additionally, Two Trees built the waterfront access first before they even started on their building. So a couple of key highlights. Um, their building is set back from the waterfront out of the flood zone. So this allows the, the build, building to be more resilient. The park itself um, was primarily a timber platform before it was demolished and rebuilt into concrete, which is um, more, is going to be more sustainable. Well, I wouldn't say sustainable. It's going to be more resilient over the years than timber would have been. Um, they maximize the view corridors for pedestrians throughout the entire site. And they even planted 170 trees, which brought the current vegetation to about 50% more than it was before. And then again, the active and passive recreation, they included dog parks, na native plant gardens, there's tennis courts, and food trucks as well. So Bronx Point, um, you can see it's this photo from before, very gray. <laughs> it, it's vacant, it was vacant along the Harlem River and currently it's in construction. So similar points that, that um, 
Domino Sugar hit, Bronx Point hit as well. LM Development Partners um, are the developers of this site. It's pretty impressive how they brought um, a soft slope shoreline or along this edge, but in between, they were able to create protection, but also bring vegetation into the protection protected areas. So the riprap itself, which is typically a, a, made out of a stone, is interlaced with all these native plant um, plantings that are able to survive within the tidal zone. And the plantings themselves actually bring more resiliency because they can absorb a lot of the water. Um, they've built a cove here with native species as well, where people are able to access, um, get access to the water. And the Billion Oyster Project is going to install reefs here that will be monitored, um, oyster reefs that is, that will be monitored and uh, surrounding um, educational facilities will be able to come here to educate their students and view those oyster reefs. So our next category in wedge is around responsible siting and coastal risk reduction. And here, you know, the, the main focus is avoiding and reducing risk from coastal hazards. Um, and that's gonna be through things like elevating the site, um, creating um, uh, different ways of protecting against storm surge um, and other threats from the water. We're also looking at projects and in, in assessing whether they've sited with ecological sensitivity, sensitivity. Have they avoided important habitat areas? Um, we support industrial water dependent uses for, for this category. And then we also are looking at the emergency response and preparedness plan for the site. Um, and our, our next project that Domenica will talk through, Oak Point McKenna Cement, um, is one that, that really focused on the um, coastal hazards pretty significantly. So historically, Oak Point McKinnis Cement was a series of rail float terminals. Again, you can see um, lots of gray, not a lot of greenery, and it also was an illegal dumping ground for many, many years. Currently, the site um, is an operational facility where Oak Point Development and McKinnis cement built this series of um, piping system that allows the cement to be brought from the vessels into the plant, but they didn't stop there. They included a 30 wide pedestrian walkway that allows people to still view the waterfront. Additionally, they have um, wetland buffer zones and they've elevated so that their major infrastructure and their facility is out of the flood zone. So Sandy Hook is another um, site that, that had similar um, modifications. During Her Hurricane Sandy, their headquarters were destroyed. Currently, um, the developer has made this into a more transparent perimeter so that people are able to see the area. There's historic displays and local education partners that come to the site to see the rich history. It employs about 100 people preserving the vital waterfront, uh, working waterfront. All the old debris was removed. And um, the reason why this all hit category one is because they elevated for future um, flood risk. They uh, used special materials such as zinc cathodic protection on the exterior of the building. And then they also built in an emergency redundancies in their electrical and mechanical equipment. Thanks, Domenica. Um, so our next um, set of, of credits is in category two around community access and connections. And here we're looking at, you know, what are the components that are going to make this a 
great waterfront space for the community. At the forefront of that is whether they're creating quality public access areas on the waterfront. And there are ways to do this regardless of whether you're, you know, a park space where it's the central focus or a, an industrial site, working waterfront site, um, or residential or mixed use where there are ways to do it even if it's not the primary vision for the project. We're also going to look at things like, particularly for the industrial sites, what are they doing to reduce impacts to, to health on um, the nearby community? We're going to look at are projects bringing educational opportunities to the waterfront, whether that's programming, whether that's passive educational features. We're also going to look at transportation access to the waterfront. Um, are you creating connections to inland transit? Are you creating opportunities for ferry access? Maritime related employment opportunities are part of the this um, category as well. We also want to see waterfront pathway and greenway connectivity so that you know there not only can you access the, the water from inland but you can get there from other sites as well. Uh, and then there's also um, the direct connection for, to the waterfront for people in boats. We want to see things like get downs. We want to see fishing with amenities. We want to see kayak launches. Um, we want to see areas where you can tie up a boat. Um, all of those things are, are some of the, the criteria that we're looking at in category two. I'll also, before I turn it to Dominica to talk about Greenpoint Landing, which is one of these great community spaces, um, I'll, I'll let the audience know if you have questions to throw them in the Q&A section, um, and we'll try to reserve a little bit of time at the at the end um, to, to talk through this. I see there's one about sea level rise already in there. So Domenica, do you want to talk about Greenpoint Landing? Sure thing. So Greenpoint Landing, um, before it was redeveloped by Brookfield Pro Properties and pa Park Tower Group, um, spent many years as a parking lot and um, even before that, lumber storage. So again, we have an unutilized site that had so much potential. So um, the reason this hit the connection category two is because the team provided non-required corridor, corridors to enhance not only visual, visual, but also physical access to the green space. Um, additionally, just the difference between what it was and what it is now is just striking. I've been here on a weekend and the amount of families and children that are there using the space as a soccer field is, is really astonishing. Um, some great things that they did at this site is they created an elevated walking pathway, which is almost like a berm um, behind the soccer fields that also would protect the community in a flooding event. Additionally, in this area is where they stored all their critical mechanical, electrical, um, any maintenance equipment that's needed to run the park. But it's also quite beautiful. And, and as you walk along the path, you can have beautiful views to the waterfront. Um, and there's additionally a soft shoreline in this area. So Domenica talked about the kind of um, the very striking difference between then and now at Greenpoint Landing. Uh, I think for Sunset Park Materials Recovery Facility um, in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, um, it's another one that it's it's a night and day difference. So you can see that this 1924 photo, um, all of these rows of piers that went out into into the harbor. Um, this space was in the yellow dashes is where the current site sits. Uh, so they demolished a lot of those piers, filled in some of the harbor, and this was back in the, in the 50s. They did all that work and then until 2010, it sat as an NYPD impound lot, not the kind of um, community asset that, that we should be using um, really important waterfront space for. Um, so today it's the home of the Sunset Park Materials Recovery Facility, um, and this is where Sims Metal Management 
um, operates a plant to manage almost the entirety of New York City's curbside recycling program. And what they do is they take the um, recycling material um, off of trucks and put it onto barges to, to then take out of New York City. Um, so this is an active working waterfront site. Um, one of those one of those uses that has to be on the waterfront. The reason that they that we wanted to highlight them within the um, community connections category is that they did a lot to make this a publicly accessible site. So you have walkways out along the water uh, that don't get in the way of the of the operations. Um, they're it, they've essentially created a trail that's got vegetation on, on both sides right along the water. Um, there are things like um, um, reefs and other features in there that help the resilience, that help the ecology of the site. And then there's a um, educational facility built into the project. So you can go watch their operations, watch them load up the barges, learn about the city's curbside recycling program. Um, and that's open to the, open to the public. Our next category is around edge resilience. So um, here's where we're looking at what projects are doing actually on the water's edge itself. Um, so this is going to be, um, you know, a, a lot of a, a lot of New York's waterfront is these long concrete bulkhead walls, these long straight line esplanades. Um, those are pretty boring uh, if you're looking at it from a public access perspective. They're pretty terrible from an, um, an ecological perspective. Uh, the water's often 10, 20, 40 feet deep immediately off that, that wall. Um, so there's no intertidal habitat. There's no shallow water. Um, it's not very good from an ecological perspective. And then they're also really ineffective for resilience. Waves can hit those walls and they just come right over the top if it's not tall enough. Um, so we, at, at, at Waterfront Alliance, we're trying to move projects away from doing those just straight line walls into something that's a better strategy, but that's still going to work for the context of the site and the intended use of the site. And a lot of this means bringing in more natural shorelines, bringing in a softer shoreline that has nature-based features in it, changing the shape of the shoreline or changing the slope of it so it's more ecologically friendly. It's also going to have an impact on slowing down waves in a storm event. We also want to see projects protecting the working edge from sea level rise and then using um, different ecological enhancements um, on structural components. So where you do have that, that wall, can you use a product like e-concrete uh, that's going to allow marine life to adhere to the wall? Um, make it a little more environmentally friendly. Um, so one project that's really reshaped the shoreline, and you've seen it on a lot of our transition slides, uh, is Hunters Point South, which Domenico will talk us through. Thank you. Um, this is one of my favorite projects. So it's striking difference when we flip to the, the current stage, but this area was primarily a use for rail, rail floats. And then there was a rezoning that needed to occur to allow this area to be um, for a new residential to be developed. So currently, um, it's Hunters Point South is this incredible, amazing 11 acre park. And as Joseph was mentioning, um, the soft shorelines getting away from the hard edge, continuous um bulkheads this does it but in a way that also um in, incorporates play and and beautiful viewing and also habitat so it's not just one type of shoreline it's many um variations they have uh, multiple layers of planting in multiple layers within the the zones of the waterfront so the different tidal every tide every part of the tide has a different zone where different types of plants can occur and and thrive so um if you haven't been here i highly recommend going it's a great way to spend a day and and the ferry brings you right um there 
where this shade structure is. There's great concessions on the site. I didn't personally work on this project and I highly commend the design team for just how incredibly amazing this place is. Um, they've incorporated different areas that different slopes and parts of the park are actually made designed to be flooded during a storm event and hold that water so that it's not impacting anything upland and so that the when the water retrieves the park is still operational um, <clears throat> in addition to that they have green infrastructure infill um, filtration for rainwater separate storm and sewer um, capacities uh, able to hold separate storm and sewer and tons of native planting. Uh, the, that tons of native planting is a is a useful transition point for us into our natural resources category category four. Um, and this is where we're looking at kind of the ecosystem and ecology and sustainability aspects of waterfront development. So um, here we're going to assess whether a project has maintained or restored biodiversity and ecosystem services, whether those ecosystems are connected, whether there's native habitat complexity there, and whether they're creating the site in a way that's going to avoid human disturbance to those natural resources. There's also a component of Wedge that's looking at the redevelopment and cleanup of contaminated sites. Um, that's something that we want to see projects doing. And, and is an important um, um, component of Wedge, given that so many of these sites are former um, industrial sites uh, that are now changing uses. This is the time to clean those up. Um, sustainable fill and soil management is a component uh, of Wedge. Resilient and renewable energy sources, environmentally social or environmentally responsible construction, reducing water use, reducing contribution to urban heat. That's particularly important in environmental justice communities where you know there are fewer trees, there's more concrete. Um, we want to see projects that are going to uh, reduce the, the urban heat in effect there. And then this this was gained a lot of attention last year after. Hurricanes, Ida and Henri, uh, but this category is also where we look at stormwater, both quantity and quality. So use our projects using green infrastructure to manage stormwater on the site, prevent flooding from um, um, rain events. And then because the waterfront site is the last land that the, the water or the runoff is going to touch before it goes into um, whatever body of water, the Hudson, the East River, the Harbor, wherever it is. Um, we're also looking at the quality. Are they, is the project doing things that's gonna clean that water uh, before it hits uh, the Harbor? Um, when projects that's, that's done this natural resources um, category particularly well is Starlight Park in the Bronx. So Starlight Park has um, a pretty impressive, very interesting history. Uh, there was an amusement park at some point here as well, um, but you can just see from the current, the from the previous before the park was developed photo, just how uninviting this area is. But currently, um, the parks department has went ahead with two phases and completed this wonderful park that includes so many things, um, but also that habitat restoration and. The, the cleaning of the water, the storm water, before it hits the water body that Joseph was alluding to before, um, this park does that in a really innovative and um, in a way that people who show up to the park don't even, wouldn't even notice. Um, additionally, it has this, this uh, parks facility building on site that has photovoltaics and geothermal heatings um, and also green walls surrounding the entire facility that bring, that allow the area to um, reduce the heat, which we know is one thing that is, that is um, I, I notice it when I, when I go out to a, a park and open space during the summer that you feel cooler than you do walking next to the pavement on the heavily crowded streets. So that's another thing that this park has, has been designed to purposely reduce heat. 
the shoreline is soft. Um, they, they've um, included plantings as well as shoreline protection along the waterfront edge. And there's a great canoe um, kayak launch spot at the park as well. Okay, um, there's rain gardens and also retention. I could go on and on about that park. So yeah, let's move on. <laughs> so Brooklyn Bridge Park, you could see originally it was a series of piers. Again, not much green space, warehouses used by the Port Authority for quite some time. Um, and then today it's reimagined, it's been reimagined and rebuilt into this beautiful um, park um, led by the Brooklyn Park Conservancy and also New York City Parks Department that um, includes many shore, soft shorelines, there's beach, two beaches, there's get down areas for people to interact with the water. Additionally, the eco-concrete plays a huge part here. There, the multiple piers that are still in use and operational as, some, as park facilities the piles have been repaired with eco-concrete. So you imagine a pile that's failing or close to failing, they've encapsulated it in this eco-concrete. And what eco-concrete does is it's low in carbon um, and also has nooks and crevices and low in pH that allows habitat to grow on it. If you're not familiar with it, um, it's, it's uh, great to research. I know there's some people from Eco Concrete here today that would love to give you a presentation. Um, but this stuff is really great because regular ordinary concrete doesn't allow for all that growth and we're losing the space for habitat. And, and the more habitat we have, the better it is for our environment. Um, currently there's a marina there with 120 uh, about 120 boats able to, to be there. The vertical walls have been replaced, as I mentioned earlier, with all soft shorelines. Um, and I think I've hit all the points. And then the last section of Wedge is our innovation category. We won't show any projects with this one. I just wanted to briefly touch on it. There are a number of things that we have seen show up on waterfront projects in the harbor that Wedge doesn't have a specific way to, to score for, but they fit the intent of resilience, ecology, and um, access really well. So we have this inventive design category um, to allow essentially bonus points for those projects. And then there's an exemplary performance um, bonus as well. So Wedge already is expecting a much higher standard from projects than um, city or state um, design codes and regulations we are. We're already well beyond code. Um, for projects that then go above and beyond from what even we're asking, that's where there's potential points around exemplary performance as well. So before we get to um, questions, and I see that there's a bunch coming into the Q&A that we'll, we'll address, um, I wanted to share a couple opportunities for folks to get involved. So if you want to learn more about the WEDGE standards, we offer the WEDGE Professionals course. And you can see the network of about 500 folks from across the country, many of whom are, are here in New York or across the river in New Jersey. Um, you can see the network that's taken this course. Uh, this is available at wedgeprofessionals.org. Um, you will walk through in more depth, like what's actually in the standards, how do they work, what are the specific design criteria um, and performance indicators that we're looking at. Um, and then we go into a series of case studies in much more depth than, than this with the actual design team. So you'll hear from um, two trees on what their, what their logic was and how they built out Domino Park. You'll hear from the, the developer and the operator of Oak Point McKenna Cement about why um, building in flood resilience was so important for them and what inspired them to build wetlands on this industrial site. We'll go, we go through projects like that. It's about a six hour course in total. You earn the Wedge Associate Credential afterwards um, and then join this, this national network of waterfront design experts. 
We have two more um, Waterfront Alliance webinars coming up. Um, climate, Art, and Science is happening on um, 921 from 5 to 6 at the Waver Tree in the Seaport District. Um, there should be a, a, a link in the, the chat to um, register for that. We also have a youth town hall, um, Know Your Waterfront, Shape Your Waterfront, uh, with our Senior Waterfront Education Coordinator, um, Jake Madalone, on Saturday from 1 to 2. Uh, there's a registration link in there as well. You can learn about what our different educational programs are, um, and this will be a, 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 a kind of hands-on um, an open town hall. And then as Courtney mentioned, we have our Heroes of the Harbor Gala coming up on the evening of Wednesday, October 12th at the Hyatt Regency, Jersey City. Um, probably the, the second best view of New York City that you're gonna get. I'm with Domenica on Hunters Point South. This is an incredible place. If you can't go there, Jersey City's waterfront, um, looking out at Lower Manhattan is is a pretty amazing place to um, to visit. So come join us at the gala and the link for that is in the chat as well. Um, so with that, we have about 10 minutes for um, questions. The way that we're gonna divide this up is, is I'll take some of the kind of um, wedge oriented questions, the questions on the projects and some of the um, kind of design oriented questions as long as we have Domenica, the engineer on the on the um, presentation, I want to um, get her take on those. So first one that I'm seeing is um, how can nature-based solutions integrate with structural needs to contribute to wedge projects? So um, I think this is a this is a, a great example of um, the use of e-concrete, which uh, Domenica referenced with Brooklyn Bridge Park and we brought up uh, with a couple other projects. This is something that's growing a lot in popularity in part because of its ecological features and in part because of its kind of versatility. It's a structural um, concrete, so it has the, the same strength and other properties that, that the standard concrete would have just with all these added benefits. So we're seeing lots of projects uh, um, do that and that can be built into riprap. I know Brooklyn Bridge Park has tide pools made out of it. It can be built into pile casings. Um, so there's just tons of different options of, of ways that projects can use e-concrete. Um, a question for Domenica, um, how specifically does the expectation of sea level rise um, impact site design. And can you talk about some of the, the kind of mitigation strategies like site elevation um, and kind of how those factor into the design of the project? Sure, so sea level rise is something that every designer should have in their mind. Um, even if you're not close to the water, uh, you should be thinking about it at all times. Um, so, but the obvious result is elevation, of course, but not just looking at elevation in a box, but holistically looking at the entire site and where your flood zones are and when, where water is likely to accumulate. And working with your elevations, your civil engineer as well, and your landscape architect on how you can create systems to mitigate. So whether that's green infrastructure, storing water, um, you know, again, raising the site at certain locations, et cetera. Thanks, Domenica. Um, hmm. Another project that we're, or another, sorry, another question that I'm seeing is around um, wedge projects um, and are wedge reviews pre presented to the public in any way to allow for communities to see different ratings. Um, so as, as we said earlier in the process, there are nine projects that are currently in some form of review. Waterfront projects, of course, move pretty slowly. So some of those will not actually complete their review um, for another two or three years by the time they get to kind of that blueprint stage. Um, when we do announce that a project has completed wedge verification, we always make that a very public announcement. Um, and we will, we'll, put out um, 
press material will do uh, an article and story on Waterwire, our newsletter, which you can all register for through um, the, the Waterfront Alliance website. And then we typically do a, a webinar that has both the um, wedge team as well as the design team to talk through what are the features that qualify this. So um, definitely, yes, we do when uh, we do present these, these wedge reviews to the public. You can also on the wedge website see all of the case studies of um, all of the, the projects that have been verified, all, all of the ones that we talked through today, you can see in more details kind of how they scored in each category and what some of the, the features that were really prominent were. Um, another question um, that I'm seeing is around the, what are the real estate financial implications um, for, for Wedge? Um, so I think what this question's kind of getting at is, you know, what's in it for um, the, the site owner um, for Wedge? Um, so, you know, the, there are um, a number of ways that we have aligned Wedge with things that are gonna benefit the, the property owner over the, over the long term, because we want more projects to go through this really rigorous, um, this rigorous process. One of the really key ones is um, the insurance side of things. So as we develop the, the web standards, and there's a new version that will be released um, early next year, we, we go through the, the kind of flooding aspects of it really closely with different um, insurance companies to make sure that what we are advocating for projects to do are going to reduce the, the risk on that site. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, we're telling sites to elevate and um, um, design with setbacks and use different protective measures that are going to be the things that are actually going to reduce risk um, from an actuarial perspective. Um, we want the things that are going to be proven um, to work and we work with the insurance industry on those. So that means that Wedge is going to be pretty well aligned with things that are going to make um, like the insurance premium on a site cheaper. The, the other thing that we're really looking at um, within Wedge from a, flood from a flood perspective is that across uh, on a normal site, you have a lot of motivation to protect your own building. You don't have a lot of motivation to protect your neighbor necessarily. Wedge creates that incentive because one of the, the key things that we're scoring for in the standards is this uh, protection for adjacent communities. We want to see that the, the waterfront is not just protecting that particular site, but it's, it's then stopping the water from coming in deeper into the neighborhood. Um, so there are, there are a couple wedge sites under review now that that um, coastal protection will provide, uh, will essentially close up the low point of the waterfront that lets water into the neighborhood. There's, there's a couple Manhattan sites that are doing this and a residential development in Brooklyn that will actually protect a couple of hundred homes because it's the low point in that neighborhood's waterfront now. Um, I think we've got time for um, one more um, question. Um, I, I see one from um, Frederick around, can you give an example of um, inventive design and innovation um, and what kind of qualifies for those bonus points? Um, so one that just to the right of the picture on the screen um, is the um, overhang structure at the ferry dock at Hunters Point South. This is this is one of my favorite ones because they they built a structure that includes like the cafe and restrooms and storage facilities. They did a lot of really interesting things with this structure. So it so it's set up to have an open plaza underneath to provide shade and and, and refuge. They built in stormwater collection um, mechanisms in the in the site that help with um, irrigation, um, 
and it has solar panels that, that provide renewable energy on the site. So they built that all into one structure when normally those would be a lot of different separate things. This was a, a, a kind of custom design structure um, that, uh, that did that. Um, See, so we've still got two minutes. That wasn't a very long answer. So um, one more question that, that I'll give to, to Domenica is, you know, on this, on this um, photo of Hunters Point South, we're seeing that there are not very many organisms living on the rocks. Um, can you talk about kind of the ways in which riprap, which is the, what those, those rocks are called, and a seawall are different from an ecological perspective? Yes. So it all comes down to the material that you're using for the riprap. Again, eco-concrete inter interlaced within this riprap or eco-concrete riprap itself would increase the habitat. Additionally, um, there was one project that we spoke about, Bronx Point, that took is planning to take some of the riprap out and put in native plantings that survive within this intertidal zone area that will also increase um, the ability to, to have more habitat. Great, thanks Dominica. Sure. Um, and with that, um, we, are, we are at our closing time. I want to thank everyone for joining today. Um, hope you enjoyed our tour of the waterfront. Um, we've included in the chat the New York City Then and Now um, link. Uh, this is where we got all of those like 1924 and 1950 aerial images. I wanted to share that link at the end because if you're like me, you're going to spend the rest of the day looking at it. Um, but I want to thank Domenica for, for joining us today. Um, and talking us through these projects. And thank you all for participating. Um, join our other webinars, find other, other Climate Week events out there, and we hope to see you at the gala and in the wedge course. Thank you all so much. Thank you.